What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Core Consult RX Podcast. Boys, I feel like we have not podcasted in a quick minute. It's been a while. And last time, I don't think we had AJ. Yeah. So this is the first... Uh, I forgot what AJ looked like. I know. He, I answered the door. I was like, can I help you? He's even more muscular than last yeah, time. That's true. It's because we're not 22 anymore, Cole. <laughs> that's what it is. It's also because I make no attempt to be muscular. <laughs> Yeah. Even if I did, it, it wouldn't work. I but. start off in my mind making an attempt, and then I go, nah. Maybe, I do it in my maybe, mind a maybe, lot. Maybe tomorrow. I think about exercising. Yeah. Yeah. But Sometimes. no, it's good, good to be back. I feel like it's Absolutely. been a while. Absolutely. AJ, good to have you back too, buddy. Back on the road to 200. That's right. Ooh, we're yeah. back on the on the path. We got 20, what, it was 174? So we're close. Nice. We have to do something. We've talked about this every episode. People are like, oh, "Are they going to do this for the when next?" They, for us, it's been weeks, but when they listen to it back to back, it's uh, like it like, feels oh, like okay. we just talked yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. It. it's because we haven't talked in a little bit, so now we're okay. Uh, yeah, that's why we won't say it next time. Mm, we sure. probably will. No yeah. promises. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we were trying to come up with uh, a topic because the next episode we are going to be recording is going to be another accredited episode. So we were trying to think of something um, a little bit you know different to do than the just disease state overview. And uh, we looked and kind of saw we haven't really done a, a patient case in a while. It's been a long time. And so some of this will be review as always, but uh, reviewing is good, I think. And uh, I did a very abbreviated version of this on uh, through like Instagram stories, and I was kind of shocked at how many people were – sending messages and stuff about it or like making comments about it and so it got some good combo going so um hopefully this will uh maybe do the the same we'll see this is a great classic case for an evidence-based method i'm this guy's perfect for making some great recommendations i think yeah no i agree this guy's uh somebody that's new to our clinic and so uh i see i saw him for his second appointment um earlier this week and so yeah we'll kind of go through it um i'll go through some of the background information basically Patient was having a lot of you know random kind of issues as far as you know felt feeling dehydrated, obviously having uh, polyuria, um, no history of diabetes himself. It was running in his family. Uh, basically, just was feeling like I mean horrible, and and went to the hospital. Went to um, the, our local u- university where Cole and I graduated, and soon to be AJ uh, MUSC. Uh, and then his blood sugar was in the seven hundreds. A one C was a thirteen point nine, and uh, they told me he had diabetes. So he went from taking some blood pressure medications, and that was kind of it. He was also taking a a Prozac 40 milligrams, um, and then he was off and on taking Pentoprazole 40. But um, really the only things he was kind of taking consistently was was HCTZ25 and amlodipine 10. No, No other history of metformin for him personally. So he went from that to... You know, giving him an insulin drip, getting his blood sugar, giving him fluids, uh, getting his blood sugar under control. And they were like, okay, let's get you set up to be discharged. And so what are we going to do? We're going to give you metformin. This is a great drug. You're going to love it. Your stomach's going to love it. We're going to start you off at a low dose of 1,000 milligrams twice a day. And then from there, we're going to add on, because they found out he had no insurance. And instead of, you know, I don't know, maybe thinking about a few options, they go, got it, MPH for you every 12 hours. And they gave him 35 units every 12 hours, and then they added on Novolin R also, and that was 15 units, plus a very elaborate sliding scale that he was supposed to do. Take, keep in mind, this gentleman has never had any history, any tr- you know, no education as far as uh, diabetes you know, management and all that stuff. So this is all completely new to him. He got like a quick overview of some pamphlets that they kind of just gave him and told him to, like what to look through. And uh, I don't know, if, you know, I'm not not trying to crap on whoever's taking care of him, but it was just one of those things. I think it was, uh, it was a busy busy weekend, and he was kind of just uh, didn't get you know as much attention as he really needed at this point. So he was discharged with with five injections a day plus uh, max dose metformin, or you know what we typically our target max dose of metformin, and uh, yeah, so he was having horrific diarrhea. And he was having blood sugars like in the 40s and 50s because he barely even knew how to check his blood sugar, Um, was having, you know, adherence issues, obviously, within the first couple days because five injections when you go from zero to five, that's insane. It's hard to get people to do one injection, let alone five. And uh, it's just all over the place. He was... He, he basically just walked into the clinic, and uh, luckily one of our new physicians was there with uh, a more open schedule because she's still kind of building um, her patient base and still going doing some of the uh, orientation type stuff. So walked in, said, I, I need help, and, you know, 
was able to get him in on his, her schedule that day. And then she again ran the A1C, 13.9, and then um, referred him over to, to me for diabetes education. So he gets to me uh, about a, a week later, and he's completely you know, devastated that this is his, what he thinks is his new life. He's like having, he's, you know, having diarrhea multiple times a day, stomach's hurting, he's nauseous, he's having hypoglycemia because of the insulin, he's, he's having to check his blood sugar all, you know, multiple times a day, obviously, so then he's skipping that, and he's just, he seems already depressed about what's going on. So, I start questioning him more about past medical history and all that, turns out he's actually had a stroke on him. He had a uh, ischemic stroke about two years ago as well. Um, his blood pressure was in the 170s systolic, uh, probably because he was stressed to the max and all that good stuff. He was only on HTTZ25 and amlodipine. He was having horrible like neuropathy and uh, like basically limb weakness because of the you know stroke. Um, caused a lot of um, nerve damage. And the neurologist they had seen a couple of years ago basically told him there's not really anything they can do for him. Um, he didn't have insurance, so he couldn't go to physical therapy. And so it was just one like mess for this guy after the other. And so it's something that uh, we'll kind of go through his regimen and kind of show what we did uh, at the clinic to kind of um, change his meds around, make things easier for him, and see how it all turned out. We'll we'll work you all the way to the end and then surprise you of how it turned out. Yeah, no spoilers. He got no better. No, <laughs> yeah, it's it's still up in the air. Yes. So where should we start, Cole? Uh, well, I guess what would be the most important thing? Probably establishing a better diabetes medication regimen for him, right? I agree. That was my first plan of attack as well. Okay. So his A1C is 13.9. Obviously, he's uninsured, so um, easy uh, options uh, you would think would be limited, but of course we have other options that we can look into. Um, and he's currently on all those insulin injections, right? Mm -hmm. So do you want to plan to keep him on that form and just have him on something lower, or would you take him off that completely and switch to some other things? So my strategy and what I explained to him, because he he obviously did not want to continue the metformin at this point because of the GI distress and all that. So I, I and you guys have heard me talk about this, so I'm sorry if this is like annoying that we're repeating this multiple times, but the home trial where they had patients who were on multiple different kind of regiments of insulin, but they had uh, half the group receive metformin added on to their insulin regimen and the other half received placebo. And the point of the study was not to necessarily lower the A1C, but there was to actually look at cardiovascular outcomes as well as like microvascular uh, events as well. And so they finished the study. They looked at the combination, the primary composite of my macro and microvascular events, and there wasn't really a difference, statistically speaking. However, when you start looking through the secondary you know, um, outcomes where you see just the macrovascular as a, you know, by itself, though, that was significantly different. Um, and so when you add metformin, you lower the de uh, decrease the chances of um, non-fatal stroke, non-fatal MI, cardiovascular death, uh, all those things we obviously want to avoid. And because they were trying to keep the A1Cs kind of the same in both groups, because obviously we know if they lower the A1C, if they're out of control with their diabetes, we lower their A1C to, to being at goal, that uh, we're going to lower cardiovascular risk as well. So they, they were trying to keep the numbers the same. So the patients ended up who were getting metformin ended up as having to reduce their daily insulin dose by as much as 19 units per day. And so, you know, granted, he's on a lot more than that, but at least, you know, I kind of brought that up that this is basically explained how it's making him more insulin sensitive and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and you know, described that the patients that got metformin also had less weight gain. Um, and even though they were trying to keep the A1Cs the same, still had a reduction of almost a half, uh, a half a point on the A1C scale. And so kind of explaining, you know, why we want metformin and not just that they gave him some old drug. But then I explained the difference between obviously the, the regular immediate release and the extended release. And I told him that since he's having such horrible issues with it, we're starting with 500 ER once a day with dinner and he's going to do that for a week or two. And then he's going to uh, add the morning dose to breakfast and we'll go from there. Right? Right. I said, we'll go slow and keep in mind. So, and I said, and I, and I always make the joke. I've used this joke a bunch of times, but the patients never hear me say it to other people. So I think it's just for them, but I'll be, I'll say like, look, if you'll try this and I explain the whole thing, I said, look, and if you try this and you don't like it, I promise I will not let anybody else put you on this and I'll throw it away in the trash with you. We'll throw it away together. And I'll go, ha, ha, I think it's a laugh like 60% of the time. Other times they just look at me like, okay, and uh, so I talked to him. He's like, okay, he's on board. We're good with metformin. And, he's, and I, I said, how, uh, how, how are you liking those five injections a day? 
and he's like, I, he's like, it's impossible. Who can do five? And, and, and if, you know, I can tell at first b- before he jumped in, it's impossible and stuff. He was kind of like, uh, cause he didn't, you know, no one wants to say, I'm not going to take my medicine. Right. But I, I, I probably, he's not aware that there's other options. Right. And so I, I said, I said, I ha- would have a very hard time keeping up with five injections a day. Kind of put myself in that. And I said, so, I mean, how do you feel about it? And that's when he was like, oh, terrible. I can't do this and all that. And I said, so, you know, we talked about him not having insurance. And he said that, you know, that's probably all he could afford. And I said, what if I can get you, because he was actually paying 30, I think 30 or 35 for like the vials mm-hmm. of the NPH and the Novolin R. And uh, I said, what if I can get you like the actual insulin pens because his mom had used those in the past mm-hmm. and uh and i said you know if we can get you the pens like the whole box of pens for 20 bucks or maybe even less and he was like what he said they told me it was 400 bucks and i said not here bro <laughs> this is the promised land so um thinking about so his a1c was 13.9 today mm-hmm. and that was after some maybe insulin and metformin use for a little while what was it when he was in the hospital do you know the, the 13.9 was when he med- I didn't check it again when okay. he was with me because it had just been two weeks. Right. So that was from the hospital. Yeah. Then. Okay. A couple weeks ago. So are you? So you're obviously thinking about putting him on um, uh, daily insulin now. Would you consider just a GLP one for a period of time and then re- re-evaluating, or was it high enough to where you wanted to go ahead and do insulin now and then additional things? So because he had gotten such a high, you know, uh, complex regimen right off the bat, my first thought was. What if they got a C-peptide and it was like non-existent? And that's what I was kind of worried about. Because you didn't Um, have that info. Yeah. And so I knew it was going to take a little bit to come back. And, you know, I talked to him about like follow-up as far as on the phone. You know, it's like, hey, I'm going to give you my personal, you know, my work number, but it's going to be go right to me. You don't have to go through our call center. I need you to check in with me like every other day. Tell me how your sugars are looking. And I said, as soon as we get the sugar down, we're going to start weaning off this insulin and stick with the GLP-1. And so the GLP-1 we went with was Victoza uh, because that's the one that we have. Uh, our, our pharmacy has 340B pricing. So our in-house pharmacy at our main clinic site has 340B pricing. And so we're able to get um, Lantus for a uh, very affordable price. And then Victoza is also, uh, you know, pennies on the dollar compared to what it would be retail price. And so I explained how the Victoza is the newer drug. And, you know, kind of went through the whole spiel about what Victoza is and, and told him that, you know, it'll because he'd also been having lows. So I told him how it's got kind of a built-in safety net to keep you from going. If, if you don't need it to take you any lower, it kind of just hangs out and waits till you eat something with sugar in it. And, um, you know, he, he liked the idea of two injections versus one, or, I mean, versus five, rather. And he said that, uh, and, I, and I told him, like, look, you, you work on this hard, we, and we spent some time going through diet and stuff. And I was like, if you work on this hard, then I promise I'll try to get you off and get it down to at least one injection. So he did. He's one of the first patients. I've given my, my work line to so many patients. And he's the first one that literally called me every other day. And he was just like, he said, hey, man, just the first time he called me, he, he said, hey, this is so-and-so. He goes, I need you to call me right away, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, I'm like, oh, no, what have I done? <laughs> and I, I pick up the phone. And I was like, I was like uh, you know, hey, Mr. So-and-so. And he goes, hey, what's up, man? Mm-hmm. He was just excited to tell me that his sugars were looking good because yeah. he was on his new thing. And I was like, okay. It's good. Let's take a little bit of that seriousness out of your voice because you scared me to death. <laughs> <laughs> Don't leave me a message like yeah. everything's bad. I was like, oh, no, i got to call him. He's, something's horribly wrong. And probably the other insulins he was on, were they syringes or did he have syringes? Pins? He was vile. So he switched from vials and yep. syringes to, to a, pens. two injectable pens with small needles. Yep. So and nice. we, we had Direct Relief, which is a program that sends us various medications that they have, and including pen needles. So I was able to get them a massive box of pen needles completely for free, too. Yes. And so, yeah, he went from spending more money on this garbage meds to yeah. – of almost half of that with way better meds. Great. So he's got metformin, which we obviously wanted to be on. He's got insulin, if nothing less, is going to knock his A1C down. He's got Victoza, which is going to have cardiovascular benefit. So we established that this guy is post-stroke, right? Yes. So is um, Jardian's going to play a role in any way in the future? So, it, it, well, that was my... Does it matter, I guess? It, when I think, like, you know... CVA, I'm thinking more along the lines, you know, ASCVD, CVA, anything like that, I'm thinking more along the lines of GLP-1. Um, not that SGLT2 inhibitors can't help with that as well. Obviously, they can, but they they're seem to be a lot more useful in the setting of uh, kidney disease and um, heart, failure. heart failure. And so I, I basically what I told him is that, hey, if, this, if the insulin's not working out, you're not able to keep up with that, then maybe we can swap to another thing. Um, I think the problem was is he was already – having to, to urinate so much that he was like freaking out about the thought of having to go more mm-hmm. than that as his glucose, you know, threshold was lowered. So I, I kept him on the, the basal insulin. I did back the dose down by 10 units compared to what they 
pad and uh, and then start him on the lowest dose of the Victoza, thinking that, okay, while he's on the 0. 0.6 Victoza, since it's almost sub-therapeutic, uh, you'll get a little bit of room there, but not much. Uh, that's the, During that week, I would start using that time to bring down the Lantus dose further to kind of see, you know, I have some wiggle room there. Right. So that's what we did. We did it over the, every other day. He was calling me, checking in, telling me his sugars. He'd read off his thing. It was great. Um, it was the easiest, like, patient education interaction I've had just because he was actually so thorough. Motivated. Yeah, he was. So second appointment comes in and, uh, you know, tells tells me he had one one low blood sugar in the last three weeks because I had a three-week follow-up with him. Uh, one low blood sugar that he hadn't told me about was a 67, so it wasn't anything crazy but we you know i basically talked to him about treating hypoglycemia because he's like i bought this massive bag of candy i can keep with me i was like okay we don't need that <laughs> we need like four pieces out of that bag and then put the rest of we're not gonna eat it uh, but uh you know we talked more we you know kind of we're going through all the diet changes he's been making so i said i'll tell you what let's check your a1c even though it's only been you know about four or five weeks obviously we'll we won't get a complete picture but we'll get a good idea of a trend and and see how it's it's been going um i should know it wasn't it, it's been longer than that because at this point it this was um this month in, in march and uh, he had left the hospital at the very end of december so mm-hmm. it's about two months total um that he had been on treatment and like been following up with me over the phone and seen one the physician had seen me once this was a second appointment check his a1c and uh, he was a 6.3. Nice. In like less than three months. Amazing. I came back in. I was like, yo. I said, how does it feel to be in the A1C Hall of Fame? He goes, what's that? <laughs> and I was like, dude, I'm building a shrine out in our lobby to tell people what's up. Because I said, your A1C is a 6. Point. He goes, heck yeah, man. He daps me up. It was great. <laughs> we were boys. And uh, he was so pumped. It was great to say. Cause, and then we talked about, because he's only on the 1.2 of Victoza. Yeah. So we talked about bumping that up, and we bumped his Lantus down further. Nice. So our goal is to uh, continue to... And at this point, what metformin dose is he on? He's on the 500 twice a day. Okay. So, and I mean, if you get the Victoza optimized, and if you can tolerate more metformin, I'm getting rid we of that might Lantus. have zero Lantus. Yeah. So he's already gone down 25 units, I think, total. Um, and then, you know, he got about 30 more to go. But his A1C is a 6.3 yeah. after less than three months. Yeah. So I, we kind of talked about... You'd back down low, on stuff right now anyway. Yeah, exactly. And I kind of talked to him about, like, the low blood sugar risk being more dangerous and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, not to... Free, if your sugars come up a touch, you know, that's okay because we want we want to get them, you know, away from not being too, too low range. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, yeah, that's the plan kind of going forward is to keep optimizing the other meds to get him off the insulin. And uh, it, it was it was good because, you know, his A1C was, yes, it was out of control, but I think sometimes people see, like, something really high, like A1C of a 14 or 15, and they're like, holy crap, we got to throw nothing but insulin out. The whole kitchen sink, right. It, like, it, nothing else is going to work for him because his A1C is so high. Yeah, I, I generally th- I think of it, if their A1C is that high and they've been on the other stuff, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's when it's like, well, insulin might be their only option. But it, if he's a new diagnosis, yeah. GLP-1, All maybe day. a little exercise metformin, crush the A1C. And the key also is the, the education around the diet, whether it's you know getting a dietitian to see him or if you're a diabetes educator or whatever, spending time with him. Because we talked about a couple of like just small things, like about the juices he was drinking. He was drinking things like apple juice and cranberry juice, thinking it was healthy yeah. and not realizing. I saw we showed him how to do food. It wasn't, I mean – Basic an hour stuff. tops. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe not even that. And now he's like, he knows exactly how many carbs he should be having. His agency's he's great. He said, he's like, I feel like a different person now. It's, it's, it's good. And so I think that's the key that people miss is they think it drives me crazy when I hear like, Oh, how much A1C can we expect with a GLP one? Only about one to one and a half. Aren't uh, wrong. Maybe if you just give it to him and kick him in the butt out the door. If you gave it to him and did, he did nothing else, yeah. that's what it would do. And I'm like, because we, that's what it, they that's what they do in the studies. They right. give it to him and do nothing else. Nothing. And so that's why that that number is there. And so yeah, I if you guys are wondering like, hey, you know, we gotta we're following the A1C reductions from the studies. That's what we would expect. Negative. You have time to spend some time educating the patient, talking to them about the sugary drinks and some of the you know the key points that you can make you know high impact changes. You will get significant results with the GLP one. And we also picked uh, – we went with Trulicity for him. I'm sorry, Victoza because it had uh, – one, he didn't have insurance. Um, and he had uh, – you know, basically, the Victoza does have some cardiovascular data. Now, the next step would be to make his regimen even simpler because the uh, the Rewind trial has, in my opinion, kind of the best uh, it's cardiovascular data amongst the GLP-1s. My goal would be to get him enrolled in, in Lilly Cares program and get him free Trulicity. And then that way he can go from even less to – you know. To, 
doing less injections than he is even now. Mm -hmm. So he's going to go from five injections a day to one a week eventually, and he's going to be quite the happy camper. What happens when they get rid of those manufacturer programs? Hopefully it'll be generic by then. Right? I think that, I mean, I feel like they're tax write-offs. I, right. I, feel, I can't imagine they would get rid of them Cause, um, until... Because I know that some of the drugs I work with, they haven't gotten rid of them, but they kind of tighten them up a little bit. Even copay cards and stuff like that, they'll start to put limitations on the benefits and things like that. So I wonder... And which the drugs that I'm thinking of aren't going to go generic for at least another decade. So, um, yeah. yeah. Anyways. I, I think it just kind of depends on the drug. The other, yeah. I mean, the other option is. You would probably go with something else that's something that similar better, that yeah. has a better program. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think even if they the generics come out, initially the manufacturer that the original is probably going to be starting to produce the generic themselves. And right. some of those companies will even include their new generic, like Epclusa for Hep C does that. Mm -hmm. You can get Savasvir or Belpatasvir. Um, through the company and all that. Yeah, so. I think um, Tech Federa for MS did yeah. that too. Yeah. So definitely some good. The, the big, the, the moral of that story though is, I, I there's too many people that default into a patient doesn't have insurance, they get glipizide or right. they get this garbage insulin from Walmart. Um, obviously, there's are there are cases where we do have to go that route. It's a good thing that we have things like cheap insulin and some you know just in the public that you know we have access to. But if you're in a state that has FQHCs, which all of them do, I'm pretty sure, uh, check and see where they are. Like in South Carolina, which is this, you know, very small state, and uh, we're not exactly in the cutting edge of uh, healthcare here. We have, I think, 16 different FQHCs. Yeah. Uh, multiple other uh, facilities have 340B pricing. All the major brand name, like new and you know newest and greatest drugs, have some form of patient assistance, and not just the copay assistance, but actually like where they can enroll and get you know the medication sent to them. You know, Nova Nordisk has theirs, Lilly has theirs. I mean, it's it's very possible if you have, and again, it's, I get it with time and all that, but if you have some of the manpower and somebody that can look into it, or at least point the patient in the right direction to it. There's yeah. so many better options. Yeah, and. Um Definitely look into those. If you're aware of it while you're seeing the patient, it can get them to sign a couple forms while they're there. It makes life so much easier. Um, and, you know, if you're a non 340B qualified um, clinic and you, you know, might feel like a failure by referring them to an FQHC, they don't have to, like, you don't have to lose their care completely, but if they have to, for them to qualify for 340B, they have to be seen at that site. Yeah. And so the, it, it's, you, you might have to look into that and be aware of where those are in your city. And uh, refer them there so they can be seen and get the drug on the cheap. Yeah, and even the ones that are not like closed pharmacies, they don't get the same 340B pricing. So in order to get those crazy discounts, they do have to be seen like Cole was saying. So that's it's a weird thing, but yeah. And sometimes people come in and they go, "What do you mean? I got prescriptions right here." Yeah. Then we have to explain. We can't film. We're not like a Walgreens. Right. And like uh, you guys look like a pharmacy. Yeah. And so. 340B qualified sites without pharmacies. The patient can still qualify for 340B. Mm -hmm. It's a little more complicated, but yeah. they can fill it at the regular pharmacy. Yeah, yeah. Right. They have like um, contract pharmacies contract and pharmacies. things. Yeah. So, so there's options, and the, the site should hopefully know about all those things. Yep. Plus, you know, like there's other programs like the Well Vista in South Carolina that you can get enrolled in. There's mm -hmm. direct relief. There's a bunch of programs. So in whatever state you're in or country you're in for that matter, check and see what kind of programs are available. And uh, if South Carolina and the United States can, can do it, I'm sure some of these other uh, – you know, that are more government funded insurance from countries and stuff can definitely get access to certain things. It's just a matter of finding the right avenues. Mm -hmm. All right. So diabetes kind of taking care of his plan. Now let's talk about his awful blood pressure regimen, which we, I'm going to backtrack now because this is going back to the first appointment. Uh, his, his blood pressure was the systolic, I think 173, um, diastolic was 89. He's already had a stroke and you know, he's, one, he's not on any kind of a statin or anything like that. He's got residual issues from the stroke. And so his blood pressure is uncontrolled. He's just asking for another one. And so what we, we looked at uh, his labs as well. He also has a uh, albumin-creatinine ratio of 126. So Which is elevated. It is elevated. Not quite 300 or, or higher, but it's moving in that direction. Again, to review his blood pressure medicines, he was on 25 milligrams of HCTZ. You know how much Cole and I love that. Love it. Um, it's my favorite drug on the planet. Amlodipine, 10 milligrams. He's already peeing all the time. Didn't he already say that? Mm -hmm. Well, which we're going to – anyways, go ahead. Well, and he's just – those two meds by themselves. I don't yes. know where they came up with that regimen, but that's what he got. No ACE, don't need it. No ARB, don't need it apparently. So – I kind of did my little spiel because when I'm trying to get by, especially when I'm changing a lot of meds, one of the things I will say is uh, in, I feel like, I, at least in my 
opinion on my, in my anecdotal evidence. I feel like this helps where I say kind of like, you know, if I'm going to give you something to put in, you know, in your body, because a lot of my patients are like, I don't want them to take medicines. It's poison. I'm like, okay, well, your blood sugar being in the A1C of 13 is also poison. But I'll say, you know, look, if I'm going to give you something to put in your body, I want it to not only lower the blood pressure, lower your cholesterol, whatever it's doing now, but I also want to keep you safe in the long term. There's a lot of medications that will lower your blood pressure. There's a handful of them that have been proven to actually reduce your risk of having issues later on. People are like, okay. And that 30-second, 20-second little spiel I feel like has been key as far as getting buy-in for my patients. Um, it's something I've been tweaking and like – you know, changing up how I say it and things like that, but it, it's helped me out a lot. And, you know, so I explained to him that the amlodipine could potentially be um, making, you know, some extra stress on his kidneys. In reality, what I was kind of getting at, that obviously I wouldn't explain it this way to him, but the if you think about the, the nephron, the afferent arterial bringing blood flow into the glomerulus, the efferent taking it out, the amlodipine by itself is going to dilate the afferent arterial. It's not going to touch the efferent side. So now you're going to have more blood flow going into the glomerulus than is leaving. So you're going to increase intraglomerular pressure, and you can actually worsen and increase the risk of proteinuria. So he's already moving in that direction, mm-hmm. and you know we need to do something to dilate the efferent side. So our, our options are basically we can do uh, an ACE or ARB, or in some cases we would do a non-dehydro protein calcium channel blocker if an ACE or ARB weren't available, mm-hmm. which he's never been on any of them. So uh, we talked to him about uh, – Angioedema or something like that. Some reason why yeah, I couldn't take it. Yeah, exactly. Because they're um, always available because like, they're basically free, Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And, and even then, like even if it's angioedema, I'm thinking ARB anyway. Right. So, yeah, he's got – there's only a couple patients I've seen actually had to go that route, but uh, it is an option. The, the, the non-dehydros will dilate the afferent and the efferent, so you have that as a backup. But, uh, yeah, we talked about low sartan because um, – you know, he, I, I can't, I'm, I'm drawing a blank now as to why, what he said that made us think ARB. I mean, a lot of people tend to like ARBs anyway, just because there's not, you don't have to worry about the cough, you don't have to worry about the angioedema risk almost at all. And so it's, I think it's ACEs we just got in the habit, and we have a lot of data with ACEs, but we also have a lot of data with ARBs now. So um, got them put on that, and then... I, they're the slight aces are the slightest bit cheaper depending on where you go if you're uninsured. I'm, um, I, and I'm actually getting confused. We were going to go an ARB, and the reason I went back to an ace, that's what it was. I'm sorry. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Backtracking. I was going to go Losartan to avoid some of those issues because I didn't know what he had had in the past, and I was waiting on his uh, CMP to come back, um, which we still would need with the, the ace or ARB. But um, I was talking to him more, and again, we brought up the stroke thing. And so that's why we ended up going with the ACE in that case, because the uh, study that I always think about after a, a ischemic stroke would be the PROGRESS trial, mm-hmm. where they did perendopril, um, which is an old-school ACE inhibitor, and then they added indapamide, and then they compared that to uh, perendopril as monotherapy. And so the combo was the one that actually reduced the risk of secondary stroke. ACE plus indapamide. Yep. And so that's kind of what I explained to him. And because his systolic was so high to begin with, and he was on HCTZ, I basically discontinued the HCTZ and replaced it with indapamide, and then gave him a touch of the uh, lisinopril um, to, to kind of create a baseline. Well, he's coming back in a couple of weeks to check his serum creatinine, make sure there's not ca- we didn't cause an AKI to, to you know, really put a bow in this whole thing. <laughs> and uh, but I explained. I said, look, that, that combo is the one that's been shown to reduce stroke. And I said, the one that you're on currently has never been shown, or at least you know the data that we have doesn't show that it actually reduces stroke. You've already had one. I want to cut as many chances as we can um, and reduce the risk as great as you know as much as we can to get you know make sure you don't have another stroke. And he says, all right, I like the sound of that. He's like, this because his arm is what's really affected. He goes, this arm's freaking annoying. He's like, I can barely feel it now. I don't want to have another one of these. I was like, all right, well, game on. <coughs> so, yeah, another reason why we don't like HCTZ, and another reason why we would be in favor of imdapamide, especially post stroke, because we actually have some data. Hydrochlorothiazide does not have any cardiovascular data positive whatsoever, right? The other thing is, and this, this is really only, a, in my mind, an issue with a patient who's on an SGLT2 inhibitor as well. Because I'm thinking glucose and the you know traveling through the the nephron, HCTZ does have a little bit of reuptake of glucose back you know into the serum. So distal convoluted tubule glucose is moving through to be excreted because that's your body's natural way of getting rid of that excess. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm choking, um, choking on my monster guys. But uh, your natural way of getting rid of that glucose, and so some of the HCTZ will grab that and bring it back into into this you know concentrated you know plasma. So. 
the endapamide has neutral effect on glucose. So I, most people will say that's probably by itself not clinically relevant, but hey, you know, just to be on the safe side, he's already had enough problems. Plus, I know endapamide's um, compared to HTTC specifically, he doesn't have chronic kidney disease, but if, if he did, they actually had head to head data that shows that it's more effective. And then, really, the, the icing on the cake for me was the progress trial with since he's already had a stroke, and we obviously wanted to make sure that uh, we're giving him optimal medications that have actually been proven to reduce that stroke, like Cole was saying. So now we have a three-drug regimen for blood pressure, which was in, what, the 170s over something mm-hmm. or something like that? He was on two, got to three, and the three that he got are a lot better. Right. We moved the lisinopril to nighttime because of, uh, you know, we wanted to have the amlodipine and the endapamide in the morning. We don't really know if he's a dipper versus a non-dipper mm-hmm. as far as his, where his blood pressure rises in the morning or in the, in, in the evening. And so um, he's getting a fresh dose of amlodipine and endapamide in the morning. The lisinopril was moved to nighttime because RAS system is more physiologically active at night. All a little bit of a shorter stuff. half-life. Yeah. So think of things like the um, the Ma- the study. Uh, Mapec. The Mapec study. Thank you, Cole. I almost said the study from Spain. I was like, that's not the name of it. <laughs> it was in Spain, but that's not the name. So Mapec or Hygieia and a couple of things like that that showed that the nighttime dosing of one of the agents can definitely help. Um, and so if you look at like the, the microvascular uh, studies that have been done in diabetic patients with things like Ramapril, they always dose it at nighttime. So again, just being all evidence-based around here. It's evidence-based as we can be. Yeah. It's good. So through drug regimen, so we're probably going to get him to the goal, blood pressure, plus we have some data about secondary prevention and that sort of thing. So 130 over 80 is probably what we're looking at, right? And his, yeah, when, in his fast forward to the second visit, his blood pressure was uh, good to go. It was below I, that. I think it was, it wasn't quite below that but it was like one i think 132 or something that was like after the first check pretty close so it was pretty close much better than 170 he's feeling better and you probably had some room to squeak up the ace and that sort of thing if yep. you needed to yep absolutely so the last thing that we kind of touched on was because you know again we've changed a bunch of meds for this poor guy and he's you know luckily at this point he's got like full trust in me now because he saw his a1c come down even though he did all the hard work but he's like all oh, right that's what's up like, what else are we doing i was like all right let's get you some more stuff so i talked to him about obviously the cholesterol being a risk factor for another secondary stroke and if we look at like the the 2018 um, american heart association guidelines for dyslipidemia the first like statin group that they have is a patient who's had clinical ascvd including a cva mm-hmm. so right off the bat regardless of what his ldl is regardless of the fact that he's got diabetes you know regardless of you know if his ldl is at quote-unquote goal or whatever he's not on a statin he needs to be in a high intensity statin and you know, the, the tendency is, especially if the LDL is not that high, because I think his was like 120 maybe at the most, um, the tendency is to go 40 milligrams of, less than a, or of a torvastatin and then go to 80, titrate it up. Unnecessary. In fact, there's, and you've probably heard Cole and I talk about this multiple times, there's, there's literally no studies except I think the ideal study was the only one, and that was only for people who couldn't tolerate 80. They went down to 40. All the evidence that we have, all the outcome data with a torvastatin is with 80 milligrams. Um, they've compared it and to, directly to the 10 milligrams in the TNT trial. Sparkle was the big post-stroke trial. So with the ischemic stroke or TIA, you get a reduction in secondary stroke, not hemorrhagic stroke, mind you, but it was I verified it was ischemic um, based on his records. And uh, a tour of 80 all day is where we, we can uh, give him the most protection possible uh, if he was – not able to tolerate the 80 milligrams. Um, you know, if he starts having the myopathies, myalgias, uh, then we can either go down to the 40 milligrams or we could look at something like every other day dosing mm-hmm. or we could also switch to a, the hydrophilic uh, high-intensity statin, so Rosuva statin. And mm-hmm. you switch basically 80 down to 40 of Rosuva mm-hmm. and it's basically the same thing. So I did a tour because that's the one that's been studied, but I had several plans in my back pocket in case we needed to go that route. Plenty of options. Admittedly, the Atorvastatin 80 is a larger pill. So, you know, if somebody has trouble swallowing, receive is a little bit smaller, but um, don't run into that too often. Um, good. And then, if in, so the goal LDL, since he's post stroke, would be what, 70? Yes, less than 70. So if we needed to, so you'd expect probably a 50% decrease with a high intensity statin. So he should probably get there. Yeah. But if he didn't, we could add on. Sedia, right? Would that be the next option? It depends on which guideline you're looking at. 
because Zeddy would be the one that I would be thinking about because I, I kind of like the American Heart Association guidelines. I will say the ACE guidelines that we don't spend as much time talking about, they're the ones that have the patients who could potentially meet that criteria for extreme risk of having a second event. And that one, their LDL goal, and according to those guidelines, would be less than 55. And instead of Zedia, they move PCSK9 inhibitors up to the list. Okay. Basically, just because the less than 55 LDL goal comes from the PCSK9 inhibitor right. studies, like four-year and all that. So it kind of makes sense. But uh, again, I yeah, it's one of those things. So either add on Zedia or, or go for PCSK9, which is a good – they're good drugs and yeah. would work and would get his, his LDL word needed oh, yeah, for sure. 16 after that. Yeah. And, and for those of you who are like, how in the heck is he going to afford that? Uh, the Well Vista is the program we're working on getting him enrolled uh, in, and they just added Repatha to their formulary. So they and they them. also have similar pa- – both of them probably went in Repatha have similar patient assistance programs yep. to Lily Care. Absolutely. Yep. If they had insurance and they're post-stroke and they have um, are on a max dose statin – they might have the insurance might require that they try Zedia too, but um, if their LDL still, they usually go for seventy from an insurance mm-hmm. perspective. But it's, if it's still not below seventy, then they'll probably cover it these days. Yeah, so, yeah. So yeah, we, we put them on that. So we can go a couple different routes if we need to, but I think the Ator of eighty for now is where we. That's where I left it. We'll see how he does. Um, still doing the Prozac forty, and like he said he feels way better just overall now because one his energy levels are up and all that, but he's also not feeling like. His life is crumbling around, right. you know, because of his medications and all that. So, and if he was, some people like sertraline for um, uh, depression and diabetes, right? Yeah, um, it's it doesn't. Of, I mean, I don't. Yeah, I don't it's, think it's a big deal. It's but. one of those things that for for me, I like, especially for him who's new to the clinic. I don't know. I mean, he seems now that I've gotten to know him better over the last two months. I think his follow up is fantastic. Yeah. When I first was talking to him, and especially when he was really down the first time I talked to him, I was like worried about his mental health for sure, you know, getting really depressed again. Cause he said he was kind of in remission from depression, but he's definitely said he was starting to feel down again, which I don't blame him whatsoever. Um, the issue with, with sertraline or citalopram or Lexapro or any of those is the, the half-life, you know, is short enough to where we do have to worry about discontinuation syndrome. And I didn't know how his follow-up was going to be since mm-hmm. he was so new to us with fluoxetine, you know, their active metabolite being norfloxetine has a seven to nine day half-life. So it's got like a built-in, taper it's still not as perfect as doing a, a true like taper you know mm-hmm. off but it's definitely better than just stopping sertraline after you've been established and getting discontinuation syndrome and now we can't tell if it's that or the actual symptoms coming back and then right. that's, that's why we ended up keeping it and now he feels great anyway so we just left it alone if you need to but that's a good point if they come in new diagnosed diabetes all these issues going on and he feels like he's actively depressed you might be tempted like oh let's switch his ssri but the, the issue right now is his new onset disease state yeah. that you have to get under control before you can actually assess his baseline depression status. Right. I mean, who wouldn't be depressed coming out of the hospital all of a sudden you've got a bag full of medicines you have to stick yourself up? I mean, are you kidding me? I would be so angry. Yep. <laughs> So yeah, it was, it was a good, good guy. It made me, that was like uh, how I started my morning off this morning at the clinic. I was like, it was, it was awesome. It was very good. He's my only patient before I went to go teach at the PA school. And I told him, I was like, man, you made my morning. He's like, you know what? You made my morning. I was like, we made each other's morning. <laughs> it was awesome. It was good stuff. I was super pumped. Um, what did we miss, AJ? Anything? Sounds good. What about some counseling points for the um, sort of approach to lifestyle changes with blood pressure i mean is there anything else that we could do to, to keep dragging that down we talked to him about um, weight loss potentially and really the aerobic um as well as resistance exercising um is good he actually used to be uh, a weightlifter back in the day so he, he really enjoys lifting uh he was thinking he only could do aerobic type stuff for his diabetes so i explained that if that helps your sugar be absor- you're absorbed into your cells one way the resistance does it a completely other way and so when you do them together that's a, a solid regimen and so he's like all right i'm gonna start lifting again and, um, and you can also encourage him that the glp1 is probably going to result in some weight loss and absolutely. sometimes when you can build some momentum with that it can be very encouraging for their actual for them to get back into exercising or whatever they're going to do for for weight loss yeah and he's so motivated that, you know, we're going to continue. When we meet with him next time, we'll kind of go through the diet stuff again, and then we'll talk more about the sodium content versus just the carbohydrate. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's one thing there. when you're dealing with such a crazy medication issues, you don't always have time to throw all the diet stuff at them. There's obviously some changes that you want to make, like you mentioned, but then once these things are a little more under control, you can really hit the diet stuff hard, and then you can really get things optimized. Yep. Anything else, AJ? Sounds good. We nail it? You proud of us? Yeah, I'm biased, so. 
Okay. Cool. Well, it wasn't my patient, so you nailed it. Good yeah. job. Oh, anything. I mean, we, we, if it was mine, who knows what would happen? <laughs> He'd been on surgery. That's I for know. Sure. <laughs> He'd been on He's like, so it's really needed then six injections. You, you, I would you, just you, been like, keep that insulin regimen and let's just throw on like a uh, bieta. This, <laughs> that oh no, <laughs> Cole is joking. He would never, <laughs> never would. I no, ever. I think I have a feeling Cole would have done the exact same thing. Would have been just as good. <laughs> so um, yeah, we're I uh, think we think pretty close, sim- pretty similar uh, when it comes to that stuff. AJ, we're still on the fence about. Well, He's be, missing two, a tenolol. Two B to Yeah, exactly. There you He's go. Tenolol, tenolol, HTT. AJ yeah. have him on a tenolol and HTT. The, the perfect combo <laughs> that we hate with all of our souls. Switch uh, fluoxetine to paroxetine. Yeah, yeah. Why Every, not? Everything we can think of. Yep, anything we can. It's a terrible idea. Uh, all right, guys. Well, I hope that was helpful. Um, definitely send us some, you know, messages or emails, whatever. If you have any comments, questions, or anything you want us to elaborate on, um, we'll if, if you know if we get some good questions, we'll try to read them out on the next episode too, and kind of keep it, the combo going if if we can. Um, but uh, or on social media, whatever. But uh, definitely, we'd like to hear your comments and thoughts on it as well. Um, if you do something different or how you know you would have handled certain things. And, uh, yeah, um, definitely appreciate all the, the support. We set a new record for downloads this month. I'm assuming I, this is not, not to you know, humble brag or anything, but um, it's because of you guys downloading and listening to our episodes. But we hit a uh, we exceeded our previous download per month. By like 30%. But, yeah, it went up 10,000 downloads That's in great. one month. So, yeah, there's 35 individual peop- 35,000 individual people that downloaded the podcast last month. Um, that is so mind blowing to me. It's not even funny. So I know we joke a lot and all that, but I cannot thank y'all enough for listening. Um, I know we get off tangents and we are sometimes monotone as the, the iTunes comments have, uh, have demonstrated, <laughs> but, uh, we really do have a blast doing this and really, really appreciate you guys listening. Um, so if you need anything at all, reach out to us on any social media platforms, um, or, uh, through email and make sure you check out the Patreon account. If you want more like traditional lectures, PowerPoint slides, all that good stuff. We'll see you guys in the next next episode. AJ, see you later, buddy. See you. See you guys.